This is breaking news from the Las Vegas Review Journal. Sponsored by Michael Gaughan's South Point Hotel, Casino, and Spa. I'll start with, I think, my motion addressing that because uh, I think that will inform the discussion that we have on the, the civil matter. Okay. Now, it's my understanding that Ms. Weatherly did provide you with some discovery. But that it was only within the last couple of days? No, no, no. Um, it was last week, but I, I've got concerns I've got to put on the record regarding the whole situation, if I may. Sure. All right, well, thank you, Your Honor. So I, I do have a very disturbing report to put on the record. Um, I need to convey the seriousness of what is going on here. Not only are we not talking about police misconduct, we're talking about prosecutorial misconduct and obstruction of justice. In court, last, last time we were here, um, the DA and LVMPD both said they were going to go ahead and comply with my request, minus, of course, the disciplinary records for Detective Gaddis and Detective Jaffe. Now, after that hearing, the next day, I had my investigator contact their office to reaffirm the fact that we were expecting that, um, per what they discussed in court. And also, too, obviously, the DA asked for another week. They, they forced a continuance, pushing things out even further. And despite all of this, they still failed to respond to my request for production. So now to ensure that we've illustrated the, the full extent of the misconduct. Again, this is not simply limited to what, what just happened or what I just discussed, but there's far more. Um, I've got to go ahead and put this on the record, Your Honor. Um, and then after that, I'm going to ask if the, Your Honor will grant a, my motion um, and have LVMPD produce these materials directly. But to, as well as if you do not, Your Honor, it's, they're just going to continue to stonewall, and that's violating my constitutional rights, but I'll get into that further. Um, to give your honor the full scope of what is going on here, I have to go back briefly into the, the history starting in 2019. Not long after I started as the Clark County Public Administrator, um, I found there was a ring that was defrauding the court and families. And I assure you, this is relevant, your honor. Excuse me, Mr. Tellis. Yes. Your honor, I, I hate to do this, but I have another matter. I'm going to go and try to get that done to come back up, but obviously able to. Yeah, no ask. problem. Thank you. No problem. Sorry, Mr. Bell. No problem, sir. Um, so, again, I had just become the Clark County Public Administrator, and I found that there was a syringe that was defrauding the court and families of deceased Clark County residents. At the time, the person that the ring was using as an administrator in court was a man named Thomas Moore, M O O R E. Uh, in early 2020, Vegas Voice, a popular senior publication, did an investigative report on Mr. Moore's activities. So not long after that, the ring began to use Cynthia Sauerland, S-A-U-E-R-L-A-N-D, as the administrator in their probate cases. The names of both can be found in hundreds of cases in Odyssey. Uh, this ring opened many of these probates, hundreds, hundreds, asserting that almost every home had substantial damage. The homes were sold at low prices, to associates who would turn around and sell the homes for as much as double as what they were purchased. Also, the rain failed to report any personal property such as jewelry, cash, firearms, collectibles, or vehicles. This would be impossible based on how many estates they had opened. The issue had been raised to the prior public administrator um, by the court and by families. However, he told the court that his office could not spare the resources to address the ring because of internal issues. When I learned of the ring, I began to file oppositions to their administrations, and I was successful. But despite my success, in many cases, the ring continued to persist with their conduct. In early 2022, I spoke with D.A. Wolfson and asked if his, if his office would investigate the ring. He said his office did not have that function, but that he would put me in touch with Detective Jaffe, that's J-A-P-P-E, but pronounced Jaffe. And Detective Jaffe worked in public corruption at LVMPD. Detective Jaffe and I met, we went over the materials I had, and then within about a month or so, he contacted me and informed me that his team had figured out one of the ways that there was likely criminal conduct. Uh, they found that there was no personal property reported in any of these cases. They were going to go ahead and set up sting operations on homes where the rain started administrations. Also on cases where they had vehicles 
that they did not report, these vehicles could be traced back to the tow yards to which they were abandoned. And because there's a high likelihood of kickbacks, they could figure all that out. There was, with the vehicles alone, over hundreds of thousands of dollars in lost values to estates. Those are vehicles that should have been sold for the benefits of families, but were given away to these tow yards, Your Honor. It's, you know, it, yeah, it was good news, though, to hear that finally their actions were going to catch up to them. Within a day of Dr. Detective Jaffe giving me the good news, I spoke to D.A. Wolfson. I shared with him the good news, and, and his reply was that he already knew. He is in close contact with Detective Jaffe on all of Detective Jaffe's important cases which, again, was, was good as far as I was concerned. However, after that, I heard nothing more about the investigation. I lost my primary election, but I continued to fight the ring in probate court. In about mid to late August, I obtained authority from the probate court to dissect one of the ring's administrations so they could prove the fraud upon the court. And then on September 2nd, 2022, Mr. German was murdered. And the investigation into Mr. German's death focused almost immediately on me, with Detective Jaffe seemingly at the helm of the case. Last week, I received proof of one of the most disturbing events in this case. I had, again, asked for discovery. I didn't get what I wanted, but I did get something that, again, shed some light on this, this concern with Detective Jaffe and, and his influence on this case, Your Honor. Uh, Detective Jaffe had actually opened after he dropped a case with probable cause, he opened a case in a need for bribery of a public official or public officer. I have an investigative report right here, in-person surveillance of me on this. So it's concerning that, again, he dropped this case that had probable cause, and he opened this sham investigation into me. It, it was a sham. As you can see, I was not charged under any crime for bribery of a public officer, and that investigation study was open. And, and it was open very shortly before Mr. German was murdered, giving Detective Jaffe the opportunity to be very involved with the murder investigation. It's a huge coincidence if Detective Jaffe was not aware that someone intended to murder Mr. German and frame me for it. Given that D.A. Wolfson was on top of all of Detective Jaffe's cases, D.A. Wolfson will at a minimum be able to testify about Detective Jaffe dropping the case of probable cause and opening a sham investigation against me at minimum. D.A. Wolfson will be able to also testify about Detective Jaffe's influence on Detective Gattis, G-A-T-U-S. You can see one of the reasons that the D.A. would be so eager to help deny me this information the stuff that I am requesting. So this now brings me to Attorney Weckerly's conduct in the case and talking more about prosecutorial misconduct. When Detective Gaddis provided two search warrant applications that had obvious mentions of warrantless stain ray surveillance and warrantless procurement of phone records, Attorney Weckerly still yet gave her approval before the applications were submitted to Judge Tierra Jones. Attorney Weckerly is a chief deputy district attorney. She, of all people, would know how critical it is to carefully review and question all search warrant applications. Because the alleged suspect has important constitutional duties, or actually, excuse me, constitutional rights that must be protected. This past Monday, and unfortunately my investigator had asked that he come and be here in case he needed to be called to testify, but he's not here, unfortunately. Um, this past Monday, I asked my investigator to email Attorney Weckerly and ask her why her emails, and there, there was so much I wasn't provided, but why specifically her emails with Gaddis were not provided, and the response was that I was not entitled to those emails. Now, there is no attorney-client privilege between the DA's office and LVMPD. Emails going to an external organization are not attorney work product. So it seems that really what 
Attorney Murphy was doing was trying to obscure her own conduct in the matter by claiming that she had the authority to deny me those emails, which she had no authority to do that. So now, as it stands, we have a prosecutor who approved search warrant applications that should not have been approved because they, they have facial violations of my constitutional rights. And she is now attempting to help LVMPD block my access to this exculpatory evidence while also trying to convict me in this case. About two months ago, in fact, I asked my investigator, well, my investigator and I were preparing the original subpoenas that, again, we have abandoned for my motion. <coughs> but during several occasions, we discussed the importance of the car washing video. And again, that car washing was a linchpin issue for these search warrants. We wanted to demonstrate that Detective Gaddis plainly lied. But not long after we served those search warrants, my investigator was apparently contacted by an employee at the DA's office. My investigator informed me that the DA was not going to let me have the video. I would only be left photos, if anything. If any, excuse me. At the time, I was shocked. I couldn't see how the DA could possibly stop me from getting the videos from Metro or from LVMPD. However, it is clear now, by taking up the duty to act as LVMPD's um, conduit for evidence production, the two can play these games where they expect that neither will be held accountable for omissions of evidence. This is absolutely, there's absolutely no good faith reason for allowing LVMPD and the DA's office to deny a defendant's constitutional right, their Sixth Amendment right, to discovery. The cover-up is more, it's really just more evidence of their misconduct in this case. And, and it's frightening, really, that the DA and LVMPD are so boldly violating my constitutional rights when the citizens of Clark County are watching. It's obvious that Attorney Weckerly is either well aware of the police misconduct or she was remaining willfully ignorant. Over a month ago, I asked her to look into the police misconduct and interview the officers. It is her duty under the rules of professional conduct to refrain from pursuing a conviction where there is no probable cause. Yet, we are still here. After knowing my claim and what I was seeking for over a month now, Attorney Lee Wakeley and LVMPD have acted as though, you know, I have made my request clear. I've made my production request very clear. And again, we were here for over a month now, and still yet, they have not been responsive. In fact, in the last hearing, Attorney Christian said they would produce everything that was requested except for the disciplinary records for Detective Gaddis and Detective Jaffe. What I received last week was 5% responsive to my request. No more. Absolutely no more than that, Your Honor. I have a constitutional right to conduct discovery under the Sixth Amendment, under the Confrontation Clause. And here that is compounded by the fact that I will be using the evidence to vindicate my Fourth Amendment rights. As it stands at this moment, the DA and LVMPD are engaging in obstruction of justice. <coughs> I look forward to hearing their responses to my assertions on the record today, as I intend to have this transcript ordered so that I might file a complaint with the Department of Justice. As of now, I respect that the court, excuse me, I respectfully request that the court enter an order granting my motion for the production of items listed therein directly from LVMP, along with the affidavits of custodian. Again, their conduct thus far has given me no faith that they will perform without an order from this court. And I am happy to prepare the order. Given that the order should be only two to three pages, I can have my investigator come during an in-person visit and I can type out the investigator, actually the order in a matter of you know, half an hour or so. And so, Your Honor, again, for the reasons I've discussed, but I implore you to enter that order so that we can protect my constitutional rights. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, you understand that you're only entitled to what the statute indicates, that discovery in a criminal case is governed by statutes and case law. And some of these things in here, I'm not sure that you would be entitled to. I mean, so they're required to turn this stuff over to you pursuant to the statute without even a request. 
but they only have to turn over what's statutorily required. Now, Your Honor, you were talking about the DA's requirement. You are not separating the two entities. The statute, and I, I've, got, I've got the statute They are right. not separate for purposes of discovery. I, if it's in the possession of Metro, it's in the possession of the DA. I respectfully disagree, Your Honor. And I've got well, the statute. Well, you can't, I, that's what the case law says. Okay, so you got, can disagree all you want. I've got, got the, the statute. Case law says. I've got the statute right here. And it, it is interesting that Your Honor is taking up the same argument that, that the DA had made to me just earlier this week. So I've got here again NRS 174.235. Mm -hmm. It says that the only thing that the prosecution cannot or is not forced to give me are internal reports, internal books, internal right. papers, internal documents, internal tangible doc, um, objects. So those are all internal things. Anything else that I'm requesting is due to me. And we are again talking about the vindication. Your Honor, we are talking about the vindication of my constitutional rights. And you're talking about, we're talking about upholding police misconduct. And if Your Honor is standing in the way of that, you are engaging in well, as well, in obstruction of justice. Because okay. these materials I'm requesting are, I'm requesting them to prove police misconduct, Your Honor. And I will ask that the court enter its order if you are denied. So I can go ahead and immediately file a petition for a rate of mandate list. Good idea, Sure. Okay. Um, I just want to say, I mean, listen, it, it's a riveting speech, <laughs> but it is chock full of total inaccuracies about the law under the state of Nevada. Clearly, Mr. Tellis has no understanding about how discovery is turned over in a case. He's already shown us that during his Beretta campus, and that speech tells us everything that we need to know. The reality is this, Nevada governs the discovery stat the discovery statutes are governed and we have to abide by those rules. We also have a temporary protective order in place that also limits things that we would normally hand over to you. So it's interesting that Mr. Tellis is frustrated over this when he also wants to keep this essentially this injunction in place and, and want to make more difficulties for him to get information. The bottom line is we already provided discovery at the beginning of this case to Ed King at the Public Defender's Office. And that information was turned over to Ryan Helmick. And then Ryan Helmick didn't turn it over to your third lawyer. So what we're talking about right now is actually your second production of discovery. So it's not like we haven't been turning these things over. You've had a lot of this stuff from jump. But now we have new issues we have to deal with. And there, are, there is information that we can't fully give over to you because of what's in place here. And if you're not happy about it, well, th these are the rules that we have to live under. I want to point out one of the things that he asked for. He asked Ms. Weckerly for all of her emails. You're not entitled to that under the Nevada Discovery Statute. And she didn't say, you said, and, and, and there's no work, there's no attorney-client privilege between Metro and, and Pam Weckerly. That's not what she said in the email. She said you're not entitled to it under Nevada's Discovery Statute. And she's 100% correct. But you wouldn't know that because the defendant doesn't practice criminal law. But then he spins out things like conspiracies and working and subterfuge and all these kind of fancy words to make it sound as if there's some sort of obstruction going in place. We're not trying to obstruct anything. We are bound by discovery statutes. We turn over what we can, and we made that clear to the court. We made it clear to his investigator. He makes claims about Ms. Weckerly's review of warrants. Again, it's a little rich to listen to him sit here and criticize Ms. Weckerly, who has been doing her job longer than he was even an attorney. It's a joke. If he has an issue with a warrant, file a motion to suppress it and provide her legal basis. But there's nothing been improper by Ms. Weckerly in this case in terms of reviewing a potential search warrant. I mean, that's, that's just, it's offensive. It's offensive. I want to address the issue about delaying the discovery. The, the bottom line is we have provided and turned over everything that is in our possession that we can right now under the auspices of these rules. And until we get a protocol in place, um, some of these other things are not, are, are not going to be produced. And that's just the reality of it. So I, I just want to address a couple of those things um, and just make that clear because that was, that was quite a speech. And your if I may reply to that. Are you done? I'm done. Okay. Again, the DA and the LVMPD are not one organization. 
And to say that I cannot request items directly from LVMPD is false. And to also say that this injunction, which is against only the items on Mr. German's devices, to somehow try to claim that this is blocking the effort for me to get the proof of police misconduct is just absurd. Council wants to raise his voice and sound like he's so upset about the indignity of being called on the carpet for their bad behavior. But it is what it is. They are obstructing of justice by failing to give me the proof of police misconduct. And it's crazy. We are here in a court of law. We are here to pursue justice. Not just what the DA's idea of justice is, but what real justice is. Justice is not convictions. Justice is getting to the truth. And they are obstructing my ability to get to the truth. And, and Your Honor, I will quote the U.S. Supreme Court. which says, the U.S. Supreme Court has held that it is as much the prosecutor's duty to refrain from improper methods calculated to produce a wrongful conviction as it is to use every legitimate means to produce a just one. The U.S. Supreme Court stated that in Berger v. U.S., for the record, the citation is 295 U.S. 78. It's, I'm, I'm floored, Your Honor. The fact that I have asserted real police misconduct, and the fact that I need the proof for that, it, it's evident. And yet, counsel says, well, file your motion to suppress. Of course, I would like to. Give me the rest of the evidence that I need to, to firmly prove the police misconduct. And again, if, if your owner's going to deny my, my request, then I'll, so be it. I will have to just we'll follow right and we'll move forward. But I am hoping that your honor sees the concern with allowing them to hide this police misconduct, to allow them to play the shell game with the evidence I need to vindicate my Fourth Amendment rights. I assure you that I will prevail. It's just a matter of how many roadblocks people are trying to put in front of me right now. Okay, we can go to the next issue regarding um, the search and the protocol for the search. I did, <coughs> excuse me, I did receive competing orders, so I don't know who wants to be heard first. I'm here from the ARJ. Your Honor, may I speak first? Um, yeah, of course. I'd just like to uh, say that make a record of the, the events that have occurred over the past couple of weeks. Um, there have been some developments. Um, and Your Honor had, had planned to proceed today to discuss what kind of search order you were going to enter. Um, at our last kind of substantive hearing where we all met, you had anticipated entering, not entering rather, but distributing to the attorneys a tentative ruling that we could discuss and um, fo you know, focus our argument on. I think that's a, a good idea, and I would encourage Your Honor, I request that no final order be entered today. Um, also, for the reason that there have been these other developments. Nine days ago, the plaintiffs, the review journal parties, and Mr. Tellis jointly submitted a request that Your Honor enter their preferred interim protocol order. Um, it was a short, brief, I don't even know that it's cited any legal authority. About 24 hours ago, Metro filed, I don't know, a 15-page legal brief um, responding to that. Uh, and we, I, I doubt Mr. Tellis has received that. I'm not sure he has. Um, it, the certificate of service did not indicate that it was emailed to his investigator. It indicated that it was mailed. So I was presuming that that was the case. Um, we, however, you know, did scramble to pull together a brief because it did raise a host of new issues that M Metro has never, or the state, they've never asserted many of the issues raised in that brief over the seven months that we've been talking about the interim pro protocol order. Nevertheless, we pulled together a brief so that we could have that on the record today just in case, you know, you can plan to enter an order. Was that what was up here this morning? Okay. Yes, yes, Your Honor. And I brought uh, copies if you don't have a copy in front of you. I'm happy to give you one. Um, the other parties have them given personal copies. I think that it is important that 
that Your Honor can, can carefully consider. Obviously, this is a, an important issue and that, that care be taken to enter this search order protocol in a way that protects every party's rights, which is what the Nevada Supreme Court expressly said in its order of limited remand should be done. And so therefore, we request that you do not enter any final order today. We are prepared to discuss with you any issues that you would like to discuss um, regarding you know, what the appropriate terms of such an order would be. Um, I think I have a pretty good idea of the terms <laughs> that each party thinks are appropriate. Yes, and I'm happy right? to go I mean, forward and discuss that. Because you submitted a, a, an order, right? We did I'm submit an order, yes. And, and Metro did as well, so I'm assuming those are the things both sides want in the order. Well, the, the order, Metro has recently, in its brief that it filed just 24 hours ago, mm -hmm. it submitted yet a new version of its proposed order, and I don't know, and they did not discuss that in the text of their brief. So I don't know if Your Honor is aware that they are now removing the right for any party on behalf of Mr. Tells, even his investigator, to be present during those searches. Um, and there was you know, no explanation given as to why that change was made. Um, but yes, our proposed uh, interim protocol order is, you know, has been the same since May 1st when we submitted that jointly with Mr. Tellis. Um, and it's, you know, similar to the prior version that we had submitted. If I, since I'm on the same... hear from Metro first and I'll sure. from you. Sure. So you're right, I did file a new brief yesterday. Okay. The reason I did that was, was because the court said um, a notice of hearing on their motion for today. And the court did that on, on Friday, so I figured maybe the court wants another brief. The brief, the most substantive part of the brief is no different than I've been arguing since September, which is we didn't I'm not cease. Sure I saw new arguments. Right, I, I, there's no, the basic argument is the same. We didn't take anything from the RJ. We took things from the victim of a homicide. The reporter's privilege was, is, and always will be personal. It's not the RJ's devices. It's not their property. They're intervening in this matter when they have no standing to do so. That's been the same argument that I made even before I hardly knew anything about this case when I first spoke with Mr. Whitman on the phone. There's, there's a problem with their standing. The only other well, thing that... it can't I, be that the privilege just dies with the reporter. Well, Your Honor... Uh, that I, just isn't logical. Well, maybe it's the family's privilege. Maybe they... But the, the RJ didn't inherit it. But, but Your Honor, let's imagine. I think, that's, I think that's something that we can explore. Let's imagine that Mr. Gehrman was only uh, brutally battered <clears throat> instead of murdered. And let's say Metro was in trying to figure out who battered him. And he consented to giving us his devices to search so that we could help him figure out who battered him. Would the RJ be able to step in and tell Mr. Gearman, no, you can't give Metro your property uh, to help Metro help you find out who did this. That's never would be able to happen. But that's essentially what is happening here. They've, they've intervened and they're interfering with an investigation when they have no standing to do so. Maybe the family has standing. It's their property, but the RJ does not have standing. The only additional thing that I raised in the briefs that I filed yesterday was I felt like because the court said a hearing on their motion that I better go through and point out all of the flaws in their protocol. Because when we were here in January, Your Honor, if, if, if the court recalls, I had already filed a counter motion to have our protective order entered as the search protocol. And the court indicated that it, that it would enter the, pro, the, the protective order. Then, fast forward to where we are today, the RJ uh, has submitted its proposed protocol again, and now I'm not sure if the court is actually um, considering the protocol versus the protective order that I had submitted back before. I'm getting the impression that the court wants to you know, weigh the differences between the well, two. My concern is, can I even delegate <clears throat> Metro's obligation and duty to investigate a homicide? 
No. That's and the, my biggest concern. Well, that's right. And so the, the new argument that's being made is that, oh, uh, well, this actually isn't a new argument. They've made this argument back before. It's actually astonishing. The argument is that their First Amendment right, which doesn't exist because we didn't take anything from them, but assuming that there is some First Amendment right here, that it's it, the only thing that could possibly compete with that is the state's duty to turn over the <coughs> and give material. But if there's... Well, they also have statutory obligations as well. And that's there right. could be, in those, in those items, there could be statutory that's documents right. or things that need to be And turned some over. of it might be inculpatory, not exculpatory. Right. But they've taken the position that if there's inculpatory material on these devices, and that it's simultaneously journalistic material, that they and they alone can let us know whether they will allow us to use that inculpatory material in the prosecution of Mr. Tellis. That's the position that they're taking, and it's ridiculous. The state has an obligation to the family, to the victims, and to the public to find every bit of evidence that's relevant in this that's case. That's how you interpret their order? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's how it works. The, the special master is to go through the materials and find out what's relevant first. Well, I noticed they left out any statutory obligation and they just refer to Brady and Giglio. Okay, right. Then when this initial review is done, there's a log that's created and the, the items and the log are given to the RJ. They're not given to you, they're not given, given to the state, and they're not given to the Metro. So we're going to have third parties that know nothing about the claims or the defenses in this case, figuring out what's relevant and what's not relevant, and letting the RJ know, and only the RJ. And then the RJ gets to go through it and determine, look, they get to look at the items, and they get to determine whether or not any of it is journalistic material. And if it is, then they get to make another log and, and protect it if they want to. Never until uh, the very end of this whole process is the court ever even involved. So it's, it's not workable. It, and yes, I, they, they take the position that exculpatory material is one thing, that inculpatory is something totally different. That their rights are always going to trump the state's rights to find and, and use inculpatory material. And that, that can't possibly be right. So that was one of the other reasons I felt like I had to file something else, because they bring that back up again in the, in the protocol. I mean, there's a lot of other problems with the protocol, too. I don't know how, you, how much you want to go through it, but... Well, I want to hear, Mr. Hanner, I, I, what do you think? Listen, we, we've, kind of, we've joined Metro's position on this. Mm -hmm. um, so we stand with the arguments that they're making. And, and again, I think our concerns are, are layered. Um, I think the standing argument is an, is an appropriate argument that, that needs to be made. It, it, it's always kind of been strange to me to think that a newspaper somehow dictates how a, a, a private person, what they get to do with their phone. And, it's, and, and when we look at that case law about you know, invoking a First Amendment right, a lot of situations it's law enforcement issuing subpoenas to a newspaper and asking, we need information out of you. That's, that's not the facts that we have here. And all Metro is trying to do is what they do in every other homicide case. If they find a victim who is dead with a phone that's on his person, they are entitled to look into that phone to try to determine if any evidence on that phone can help identify the person's killer. I mean, it's, it's a real basic thing. And, and we believe that Metro's proposed uh, plan <coughs> offers a level of confidentiality where if there's information out there that's sensitive to the RJ but doesn't fall under Brady or Giglio or isn't inculpatory that the court thinks shouldn't be disclosed, well, the parties are bound, Mr. Tellis and, and, and the state are bound to not disclose it and not make it public. And I think that that's, in, that's important. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, we, we stand with what they've kind of laid out. I mean, I know those briefs are lengthy. Um, but I think the court is right. They, their protocol, the RJ's protocol, haven't laid out the statutory obligations as the court has noted. You mean the RJ? The RJ, I'm sorry. Uh, they haven't laid out, as the court has noted, um, statutory obligations that the parties are obliged to follow. Um, and that is a concern. 
so at this point, we, we stand with, with the RJ, or don't stand with the RJ, uh, we stand with Metro. <laughs> Mr. Your Honor, take it's, note of that. <laughs> it's interesting that, you know, they've claimed, LVMP, that this is strictly in the pursuit of exculpatory evidence, that my constitutional rights are originally, is what they claimed. Originally, they claimed that they needed to respect my constitutional rights, and that my constitutional rights trump the constitutional rights of the LVRJ. And that was the basis for the argument that they be allowed to go from end to end on all of Mr. German's electronic devices. And so my concern, Your Honor, is that this is a bad faith argument. When, and, and think of this, Your Honor, if for some reason I was confident that, that they were acting in, in good faith, if they actually provided all the documentation that I requested per my motion, then I could perhaps think that that they are truly, or were truly, just looking for exculpatory evidence to pass to me. It is clear now that they're on some type of fishing expedition to go through his entire phone, or his, all of his devices. And now to say, oh well, just kidding, now we're looking for inculpatory evidence. All of a sudden, it, it's now showing that... Well, they're required to, in yeah, any you're, you're discovery, a, they're required to comply with their statutory obligations as well as the case law. So I, I'm not sure what and you're trying to argue. What I'm saying is, if that was the case, why wasn't that argued to begin with? Their argument to because begin with it's was... it's so obvious. You know, well, you know, then they still frankly should have raised it with the Supreme Court. That would have been an additional important argument if really, truly, their, their the rights... The Supreme Court knows that they have statutory obligations. And, and, yeah. So... I mean, do you have anything else to say about the order? Because it I, appears as though you I am, have entered I, into a stipulation. I do, Your Honor. And then okay. again, please, if you, you know, no, would like I, to I make mean, my... I, I'm pretty much, if you have anything else to say about the order, I, I'll be happy to hear that. But, but again, I, I do need to get the record out. I, I, I told you, I, I do plan to file a petition for written mandamus. So I do also have a constitutional okay. right to be heard in court as well. Not at the expense of everybody else. Well, it's... Only us here, Your Honor. Um, there are no other defendants in, in, in this in this courtroom. So, if yes, you have reason, don't be just a moment. Say about the protocol order. I'll hear that. Yes. Otherwise, I do. Again, it is clear that LVMPD has a bad faith purpose for for trying to get into these devices. I disagree with Your Honor's assertions about investigation. They've already completed their investigation. They've already made their charges. To now say they're reopening their investigation is just ridiculous. But again, that, that's something that the court and I will disagree upon. I am concerned, again, that their original argument was that I was to get exculpatory evidence, yet they want to be in charge of the process. And now, all of a sudden, they've cut me out of the process entirely, saying, well, since he's signing with the RJ, we can just penalize him and take him out of the process altogether. Again, bad faith. So I'm asking that Your Honor grant the motion by the RJ, the LVRJ, and I would like for the exculpatory evidence to come to me and me alone. Because again, if, it's, if it was truly just about my rights to exculpatory evidence, then well, of then the, the exculpatory then the, evidence is going to come to you. I don't know what that means. To me only, Your Honor. To me only. Not to the DA, not to the not to LVMP, LVMPD. Because if it's exculpatory and it's for my use, I should get to decide whether to use it or not. It is not for the DA or for LVMPD to say whether or not I should get to use it. So therefore, give it to me and me alone if you are acting in good faith. That's it. So that's, you know, that is my argument, Your Honor, that after the process with the special master, that, the, that these items come to me alone. And that's interesting because okay. that could not happen. This is not a civil case. This is a criminal case. I just have to make one comment. Under under Metro's protective order, Mr. Gehrman's electronic devices, the entire content of Mr. Gehrman's electronic devices go to Mr. Tellis. They come to the state as well, but it comes to you, sir. So you have the opportunity to review all of it. You can decide for yourself what's really good for my case. And at the same time, what it sounds like Mr. Tellis fails to understand 
is the laws of Nevada also obligate the state of Nevada to review that material to see if we believe something's exculpatory. So even if Mr. Tellis doesn't look at a piece of evidence and think, oh, that's exculpatory, we still need that opportunity. Because as this court knows, we can try him, and if he's found guilty, there's other lawyers that come down the road who look at it and go, well, why wasn't this particular thing turned over? If it's left in the hands of Mr. Tellis to decide what every other experienced criminal lawyer down the road in post-conviction, what he decides is, oh, this one's exculpatory, that's not a good precedent. And that's why the law still puts it upon the state an obligation to review all of the material to say, hey, is this potentially exculpatory? So under Metro's plan, you get it all, you can review it all, and if we think there are things that are in there, we can pass them along. But under our plan, uh, you get it all. You get everything under the device. You just can't talk about certain things to the public that may uh, infringe on their First Amendment right, dealing with media stuff that has no ties to our case. So that, that's all I wanted to lay out. Your Honor, I do have uh, responses to, to the points of both parties. Um, we'll start with the last one first. I did not read Metro's proposed protective order as doing what Mr. Hamner uh, just described, uh, providing him, providing Mr. Tellus with everything. So if that is, what well, he's referring to the RJ's order. Oh, you were you were referring to our order? Is as he said, he said Metro. He did yeah. say Metro. Do you mean Metro or I, well, Yes, I did. I said Metro. Okay, sorry, sorry. So, so I, I, I'm not sure that Mr. Hamner is even correctly articulating what their proposed order is. Um, I'm going to leave standing aside for the moment. And I want to just raise to your honor's attention, at first I want to ask, have you had an opportunity to read what we filed this morning? I literally just saw it on my desk up there this morning. So of course I want to have okay. an opportunity. Okay. I have drafted an order. I'm prepared to enter it. I obviously won't do it until I have had an opportunity um, to review, you know, your latest submission. Okay, that's great, Your Honor. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Um, so I just want to raise a few points that, that are in it. The sure. most salient point is that the Court of Appeals entered an order a month ago that basically answers a lot of the questions that have been raised in this case. It's it's a it's a and it involves Metro as a party. And there is issue preclusion. They are collaterally stopped from arguing many of the arguments that they are putting forth in this case at this point. Um, there is as such as the way that the privilege works when materials are in the possession of state and the third party asserts privilege over them. There was a case where Metro sees materials from third parties, it was two strip clubs that were being investigated. They asserted two privileges, the attorney-client privilege and the accountant uh, privilege. Um, and Metro made all, you know, many of the same arguments. There are some unique, unique to this case, of course, uh, about jurisdiction, <coughs> about um, this being the wrong court, the wrong way to proceed, uh, and about how, you know, most, most importantly for your purpose today, how privileges should be dealt with in a criminal case when they are asserted by a third, by a party or third party. And the court there held that the order entered by the district court, which was Metro's proposed order, which was similar, just a protective order, was error because it did not adequately protect those privileges. And the Court of Appeal held that the materials needed to be provided to the privileged asserter, the party asserting those privileges, first to review them in order to make those privilege assertions by way of a privilege law, exactly what our order does, so that the court can then, you know, rule on those privilege assertions. Our interim protocol order <coughs> does all of that and more. It actually provides for a multi-layered review that could end this dispute altogether and wind up with there being no material that's privileged, there being no material that's privileged that the RJ continues to assert privilege in. In other words, it may decide to waive its privilege in some of that material. <coughs> so it's a very, it's a very
comprehensive order tailored to the specific privilege at issue in this case, which, by the way, is a stronger privilege than the privileges asserted in that case. Um, and it, the protective order that the state and metro are proffering, it, it, it's wildly inadequate, according to the Court of Appeals decision just a month ago. I want to make clear that it's an unpublished disposition, but under the rules, we are allowed to provide it to your honor, and we, we set that forth uh, in the brief because we are asserting uh, collateral estoppel by, virtue, by way of issue preclusion. Um, so that's one very important thing I wanted to raise. Metro uh, takes the position that you know nothing that it said in its brief this morning is new. It's pretty much a rehash. All of the issues that it raised with our protect with our proposed order, which has been around for a very long time, are new, and so they require some thought and some digestion by the court and the parties. Um, in response to Mr. Christian's comment that, oh, you know, his hypothetical about let's say Mr. Theron was battered and not murdered, um, would the review, would the review journal have standing? Yes, it would as would Mr. Fairman. They both hold the court's privilege. Uh, there is a concern you asked, Your Honor, is that there, you had a concern of, can you delegate Metro's duty to investigate? That's not what we're asking you to do. Well, that's exactly what you're asking me to do in the order. You're asking me to take it all from Metro and the state and put it in the hands of two special masters. No, Your Honor. Um, well, let me... Yeah, that, I mean, no, it's, it's, it, that, it, with respect, Your Honor, it okay. does not put it completely in the hands of the special masters. The special, the special masters play a very limited role. They simply facilitate the process of the privilege review, and they create logs that would be of the nature that a party might want to make various different kinds of arguments, constitutional, statutory, in order to argue that the privilege is overcome. Those arguments would ultimately come to you by virtue of the special master's report and recommendation. So the special masters would take the first crack at those legal issues, issue report, or it's called in your rules a report and recommendations. You, Your Honor, would then take that and you would have an opportunity to completely reject it. You would have the opportunity to look at material in camera. You are the ultimate decision maker in this process. That's why we call it an interim protocol order. It is an interim step in this process. It's not the end game. So there's no delegation of any of any party's duty in this case in the, by, by virtue of this order. You you did mention you, that, that the order did not reflect, it talks about Brady and Giglio, which I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, but it didn't include certain uh, criminal statutory obligations of prosecutors. We are happy, this is the first time we've heard that. Again, this thing's been around a long time. I wish that they would engage with us to discuss these issues. We're happy to amend it, to include that. Uh, I heard, you know, we, we, the RJ, the review journal parties and the review journal parties alone get to decide what's turned over to, to them and to Mr. Tellis at the end of his protocol work. That's absurd. That is not what it does. Again, they, any party, Metro, the state, Mr. Tellis, the review journal parties, any party has an opportunity to file a motion to your honor at the conclusion of implementation of that minimum protocol work. So, you know, the, 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 the state and Metro are misstating to the court how the interim protocol order works. They are making suggestions they should have made a long time ago. You know, we, we should really, again, do, do what the you know, Justice Court told us to do seven months ago. Go out in the hall. See if you can work out the details of the order. Yeah, I know, I mean, we're, guys can't. <laughs> I know the ship has sailed, and I agree. We couldn't. But, but you know, here we are in, in, in the courtroom kind of trying to negotiate language that, that we're happy to adjust. Um, it, it seems a little silly uh, for, for Your Honor, may I say anything from this? Of course. Yeah. 
Yeah. Not excluded. Yeah, Your Honor. Um, the special master does not take the place of the court either. So you're not delegating any judicial function to special masters. Special masters are regularly consulted, or appointed in criminal cases to deal with exactly this kind of issue. Privilege reviews, complicated privilege reviews. Sometimes the court can do it themselves, sometimes they can't. In a case like this, it, it seems prudent to appoint special masters to create all these laws for the reasons that we've set forth. And I want to say, I want to make, make clear, because it sometimes gets lost in the discussion. Well, number one, parties in a criminal case are not automatically entitled, whether by virtue of statutory rights, by virtue of constitutional rights, you're right. To, to privileged material of another party. They do not automatically get that material. You have to adjudicate whether the privilege um, supersedes those rights. And that has to be done here. And in this case, the, the, the privilege that, that the review journal parties are asserting is a, an order of magnitude stronger than the privilege that your honor is typically asked to deal with, which is the attorney-client privilege. That's a privilege arising from the public policy protecting confidential relationships. This privilege arises from something different, even though there is that same idea of confidentiality with confidential sources. It actually arises from public policy, the public policy in protecting a free press, a free press's ability to, to, to uncover corruption and wrongdoing and provide information on matters of public concern to the public. And it's the, it is shown to be so strong by the fact that this state has entered one of the strongest such privileges in the country. It's an absolute privilege. So I want it to be clear that the Review Journal's position is that no party in the courtroom can overcome this privilege. Not, not Mr. Tellis, not the state, under any circumstances. So we have an absolute privilege. We didn't even need to file all of this. The Review Journal is, in the interest of justice, agreeing to relinquish that privilege to the degree that it is willing to enter, to have the court enter, the interim protocol order. So I just, that's kind of a point that gets lost, but I wanted to make sure that Your Honor understood our position and that we're on the record. Yes, please. Originally, Metro and the DA's position was that they were arguing with us because they were trying to protect Mr. Tellis' rights. Well, Your Honor, he's his own lawyer, he is a lawyer, and he believes our protocol does more to protect his rights than the one that they're proposing. In light of the fact that Ms. Kissinger has just articulated our willingness to try to work something out here that protects everybody, our protocol should be put in place. If the concern is somehow Mr. Pellis is going to be impacted in future appeals or whatever, he's agreeing to this. So I would submit to you, Your Honor, that our proposal is the one that meets his needs, that meets their needs, and we're giving up something, but don't meet our needs. I hate, to, I hate to say one more thing, because that okay. was a beautiful conclusion, but this is important. <laughs> <laughs> this is to ask us thing we remember, this important point. Um, that Court of Appeals decision that was handed down a month ago, it makes clear that it is error to enter an order that would allow Metro detectives and district attorneys to be on the review team searching these privileged materials. That's clear. It's clear cut. They are precluded from even requesting that. Um, and, and so, does the state and council for Metro agree with that? No. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm going to. I'm glad That's that okay. that case was brought up, and I'll be addressing it as soon as it's my turn again. That's okay. I just thought if you agreed, well, why are we here? Your, your Honor, if you're going to take some time to consider that, I would suggest rather than replying in some verbal way now that this, this, the district attorney's 
file something trying to distinguish that case so that we have a chance to study it. Well, everybody anyone, has submitted any, briefs. Anyone that reads the case will easily distinguish it on the first go around. Well, the, the, I, I failed what that happened, that. What happened? What happened? What happened in the hustle hustle case, Your Honor? Is Metro was investigating the Hustler Club and I think uh, Little Darlings for um, encouraging prostitution in their establishments. So they got a search warrant and they ex executed it upon the Little Darlings and the Hustler Club. So the attorney-client privilege materials that were supposedly going to be on these devices were not the third party's materials, as Ms. Kissinger keeps saying. The, it's the subject of the investigation's property that was seized. Oh, like the target? The target is their, of the investigation, that's right. their attorney-client privilege? Yeah, the target of the investigation, and it was their property. There was no question that we seized property from Little Darlings and Hustler Club. Little Darlings and Hustler Club came to court. They saw a motion for return of property. They saw it to uh, quash the warrant, and they sought to unseal the warrant, and uh, uh, I don't, motion to suppress, I think. So yes, the Supreme Court decided that because the that was their property, and they were the ones filing the motions, then they should have an opportunity to, to provide a privilege log, which apparently they couldn't do because they didn't have copies of what was on the devices. So this is different, and it goes right back to, we didn't take anything from DRJ. If we had taken, if we had executed a search warrant at Glenn Cook's house or the offices of the Las Vegas Review Journal, then they would have standing in the But that's not what happened. And that's not what happened in little governments either. So you're, you're so right. what, if one of my associates was at home doing work on one of our files and they went into his house and took the file, are they suggesting that the law firm couldn't intercede to protect the privileged materials that would be in the file? That's absurd. Your Honor, if I may also, I, I've got, I haven't been able to speak again, this is my first time. I'm, well, this is not your third time speaking. <laughs> well, so I'm, I'm referring to the, to the, the RJ's order. motion. Is what I'm referring it's to. specifically about the order. Yeah, absolutely. At some point, we got to wind it down. Oh, of course, Your Honor. But I need to put this on the record. The fact is that Metro and LVMPD keep saying we we have a constitutional duty to, to review all this information if there's anything exculpatory. We have a constitutional duty to give it to, to Mr. Tellis. But yet they don't treat the evidence that I have asked them for as, you know, they, they've not done that review for that evidence. Okay, so because by the time I finally, by the time I finally get it, I, I, I'm showing you, Your Honor, the hypocrisy of, of okay. what is going on here. You know what? And you it is relevant, Your Honor. Something and it is relevant. You can lay out the hypocrisy that you think there is shown, but is there anything else from the parties? Awesome, Your Honor. The distinction that Mr. Um, Kristen raised I did misspeak. It wasn't a third party. It was it was a target of the investigation. But what does that have? What is what, the distinction without a difference? Not only is the distinction without a difference, it actually makes our position stronger. This is a third party's privilege that they're asserting. So, I, you know, I, I would, I'll be interested in seeing what how, how, you know, the brief turns out that that somehow matters. Um, we all read the case and it strikes us as being on all fours in the relevant respects that we've discussed and demonstrating that, that their order is, is would be error. Okay, anything else? Because what I think I'll do is I'll um, just circulate a draft order and give the parties an opportunity to make any objections. I'll make sure Mr. Tellis gets a copy of it as well. Thank you, um, and and then, I just want to have speaking issue. Mr. Um, Drew Christensen can provide that. 
Oh, no. What? You, okay. you're, who's giving your investigator a hard time? Nobody should be giving your investigator a hard well, time. They should not. They should not at all. You know, he's got friends in, in Metro and in the VA, and, and unfortunately, you know, again, it's, the way things have been recently, I'm, it, it, it is what it is. And you know, if I have to, I'll just hire another investigator. That's all wrong. And so I just need to get that list. But you say that uh, Attorney Christensen. Andrew Christensen, he's okay. the one that. Okay. Um, and do you know? Um, do you want to be? Are you asking to have your investigator replaced? Your Honor, I'm I'm funding the investigator in my own pocket, so I'm just asking for a list of contacts. Oh, you just want? Your, okay, I get it. Yeah. You yeah. just want one so you can um, review it. Okay. Correct. So if you all, right, have, if the court happens to have one, um, I I appreciate it. Sure. Okay. It May I get that before I leave here? I, I don't have it here. I'll have to ask Drew for it. Okay. And then we'll um, see that it gets to you. Okay. If, if I call from jail to your Honor's um, chambers, will they pick up the phone? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. I don't see why not. Okay. So I want to wait. Is it a collect call? No. No. It's not a collect call. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I don't see why not. Okay. And then we have to set a new um, trial readiness date. So uh, the following status check trial readiness date will be July 5th at 8.30. Well, it's just a trial readiness date. Oh, okay. We'll probably be back together before then. It's good to see everybody. Uh, may, may I take a moment to just chat with Attorney Kissinger? Just real quick, is that all right? If she wants to, yeah, absolutely. Thank, Thank, Thank you very you. much. Appreciate it. Uh, You've been watching breaking news from the Las Vegas Review-Journal, sponsored by Michael Gaughan's South Point Hotel, Casino, and Spa.